Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift, the online cycling platform that makes training fun. LR and Benji here for the Stage 7 of the Giro d'Italia 2022, a 196-kilometer stage with 4,750 meters of climbing, really hard medium mountain stage, no mountaintop finish, no climb over like 10 kilometers without a break in it, there's the Monte Grande, which I swear was called the Monte Scuro in earlier profiles. I saw maybe that's a different stage. 6K is 9.6%. That's serious. 3K is at like 10 and a half, 11% in the middle of it. And then the finish is like an uphill punch as well. It's just a nasty medium mountain stage, exactly or very similar to the stage 20 of the Vuelta last year where Lopez Movistar career was ended by Ineos. So the question was, would any of the GC teams try anything? I was looking firmly at Ineos and Bahrain. They have the strongest teams here. They got Poles, Tullet, Narvaez, Sivakov, who was part of that Volta 2020, Volta Stage 20 raid. I was looking at them to try something because Almeida and Yates, eh, I don't think messy stages are their forte. But the question was how big the break would be, who would get in the break. Were you surprised, Benji, to see UAE trying to get in the break with Ulysses, Covey and Formolo one by one? I was mostly surprised by Formolo being one of the first ones to do it because I can see a satellite rider role in a Covey or a Ulysses or something in the breakaway. But we also need to keep in mind that this is the kind of stage that if an ambush by Ineos happens, that Almeida could be hurt here. So they need to keep their men with Almeida as well, in my opinion. And I think I was mainly surprised by the fact that Formula is the one going earlier on and trying to uh, go in the breakaway multiple times in the earlier parts of the stage. And that's because I'd argue he's one of the stronger riders in that team to support Almeida. But we've spoken a few times about whether he is here for Almeida or for his own goals at this race because he's been a bit uh, puzzly about that in the run into the Giro d'Italia what do you think was his personal aim in this uh breakaway adventure his attempts to go in the breakaway win the stage there's two teams in UAE there's an Italian team with Ulysses, Covey and Formolo and then then there's a Portuguese team I don't even think it's controversial I literally think they've they've divvied it up that way Costa and Oliveira are the Portuguese bodyguards for Almeida and the Italian guys have had more of a free role. We saw it on stage one where Formolo gave Ulisi the lead out, but Formolo was stronger and Ulisi let his wheel go. So that's that's why I was like, ooh, okay. They're, they're spending their best medium mountain rider. Ineos should be happy with what they're seeing here. Uh, but before we get into the uh, carnage that happened with a break would not go in this stage, mention our show partners Zwift we loved our time on the ground in Budapest and if you want to go over to France for the Tour de France fam of X Zwift there's just a couple of days left to complete the new rules mission and ride 100 kilometers on Zwift so you'll have to put in a, a quick shift if you're starting now for your chance to win a VIP riding and spectating trip to France head to Zwift.com for the full T's and C's and to start your free seven day trial in the link down below so the break struggled to go there was a descent off the Paso collar then first nine and a half k 4.6 percent climb and poles was doing that thing where he was dangling in front of the peloton he did it in the tour de france last year it eventually cost him formolo had tried and so the, who was in the break benji it was poles had gone villela Formolo on Formolo pace for Lilla across. Then there was a Yolo guy. Then there was Fellini, and it started to swell. And then we saw all of a sudden on descent footage two Ineos riders with MVDP who'd been active trying to get into the break. Yeah, and advice was in that move with Carapaz and also much of Underpool. And you know that when that happens, then the entire group behind is going to panic. You know that everybody's going to be like, oh shit. Carapaz just left the station. We got to follow that train. And you started seeing teams move to the front of that chasing group behind Carapaz. In the front group, Formulo probably got into his ear. Mate, mate, we're in trouble. There's something happening here. And then he just decided to attack that breakaway and go ahead on his merry way, get a bit ahead of that breakaway. At the same time that 
Carapaz and Narvaez was closing down the back of that breakaway. So it all kind of came together, but immediately came loose again because Formula decided to hammer it just when Carapaz came towards that front group. And whether it's for his personal gain or whether it is for the fact that Almeida's behind, it's probably for his personal gain. Let's be honest about it. Formula made a pretty wise decision to hammer it right at the moment. It could be coincidental that Carapaz hangs on to that breakaway because that makes it so that Narvaez needs to get to the front immediately to try and close it down again. And that is a few seconds where that second group with Carapaz is not necessarily pacing as hard and the group behind is able to come back in some way. But this is 140 kilometers from the finish line with Carapaz making a move like this. We expected some kind of action from Ineos. Was this what you were expecting or was this like too early? I don't know if there was just a split on the descent and they so happened to be in that position and it was like, okay, well, let's try and get to the break. Bike exchange shut it down so fast that it didn't really amount to anything. And even if they got to that break, Formula wouldn't have worked. So many people wouldn't have worked with him anyway. So it was a bit early, but if you, uh, it didn't cost him anything, he was brought on the wheels. So whatever, why not try? Formula was smart and then he goes... There's a counterattack later from the peloton. Uh, I think from Cohen Bowman goes across, and then Tom Dumoulin makes his way and Mollema. So I'm trying to think who it was. It was Mollema bringing Dumoulin across because Mollema had gone to Dumoulin and Dumoulin had Bowman ahead of him. And so we eventually had the break of the day. Villela, Poles, who'd get dropped out of it later. He repeated the mistakes of the Tour de France last year. Bowman, Formolo. Dumoulin, I've already said, and Mollema. They're the main ones. Knock, knock. Who? Diego Camargo, mate. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, forgot about him. <laughs> it could have gone for Court. That's true. But Court tried a few times to get in the breakaway and didn't really uh, seem to get where he wants to go. I want to mention one thing outside of this breakaway, though, that happened in the peloton, and it, it caught my eye. It's the fact that at a certain point, there were two people from Trek at the same time having a Hey, a bike change or wheel change, whatever, behind the peloton. And at that exact moment, the patron of the peloton, Mr. Juan P. Lopez himself, decided to tell to everybody, this is our moment. This is our uh, our pissing break. We're going to sit up here. We're going to try and uh, pause it here. Great tactic, right? If it was planned. Maybe. I think Juan P. Lopez thinks he's like peak Armstrong. <laughs> the way he's commanding the peloton at the moment. He goes to Frank. It's funny. Hey, 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 everybody, stop. Cut it out. He literally is telling you, he's shouting really cautious to say no. And his chin, he's always like looking up at you. Hilarious stuff. Um, I'm glad they freed Mollema today. I was worried when I picked him yesterday. Oh, are they going to free him? They did. And anyway, the Peloton was like, done. Enough. So then 45, 50 Ks, nothing happened. Breaks forms. It's working okay. Dumoulin's being a little bit annoying to the other riders, which he's entitled to, losing the wheel of Bowman, etc. But it's working. Three, four-minute gap happens. Break is established. The next question is, this 6K, 9.6% climb, is, are the GC guys going to do anything? The break has gotten too, uh, too much time. They're not going to bring them back. The answer is no. I was kind of surprised, Benji, because... Rui Costa is pretty washed. Like Saudi Tour, he was terrible. And I know he was there for Almeida, but it's an illusion. Any pace put on that climb, Almeida. He's the the only guy for Almeida. I was really surprised because if I was Ineos, I'd be looking at the race in two ways. Almeida, suspect on these messy stages, can lose them in the medium mountains. But then third week, if he's on, he can spank you in the mountains if he comes good. Conversely, Simon Yates can lose in the third week we've seen. So I'd be trying to yeah, put some time into Almeida. Were you surprised no GC teams tried or is it ridiculous to expect it with it cresting, what, 60Ks from the finish? I think there was potential to try something here. I think the only reason that I didn't believe in it happening anymore is the fact that Carapaz and Narvaez kind of showed their hand early on in the stage, showing that they're down to do crazy stuff. And maybe it was accidental that the gap opened up early on, but it did show that they were willing to do something. And perhaps that's kind of like, it would be too expected from that point on was that they try something on a climb because the the other teams were near the front on that climb. I think Bike Exchange was pretty much ready for when action happened. Saw Maidan near the front as well. So action could have occurred there. They could have tried something. They went to the front, but they decided not to. And yeah, I'm... 
I'm not necessarily surprised knowing that this is still the first week of a Grand Tour, knowing that Blockhouse is coming this weekend. They are probably afraid of spending their bickies a bit too early. Yes, that's the first time I stole your expression right there. I'm very sorry about that. Do I need to pay for the usage or what? Yes, if you could please provide some revenue to the uh, Australian Taxation Office, that'd be much appreciated. But yeah, nothing happened on that climb break. Nothing really happened either. Bowman's taken KOM points. I think he's now in the Malia Azura. My maths is correct. And yeah, I still think even if you don't drop Yates, maybe Yates and Bike Exchange will work with you if you put in Armada into difficulty. The problem is that the person you'd want to try with is Port, who's the second GC option close. He's not a good descender. I don't remember him doing things like that. He probably wouldn't want to. So it's Carapaz, who be, who's the man who has the cojones to try something like that, but he's their first tier GC guy. So no, they don't want to do that. Him go solo. And speaking of marginal losses, they got Carapaz sitting behind Port on the descent after this climb. Just don't. Like, you cannot have Carapaz follow Port around on descents for three weeks. That's insane to me. But anyway, that's what it was. So we get to the second last major climb. Break's going to win. La Celata. In, I want to talk about what Ineos are doing at the back end. I'll start finish with the break first because they don't get caught. Dumoulin pacing. He's, I think, drops Bowman initially. When he's attacked, he's had a chance. And then he's got Mollema countering him with Formula, I think, countering again. What did you think should have been the strategy from Yumbo Visma Benji without 2020 hindsight with Bowman, who's quite punchy, and Dumoulin, who was just like couldn't go above 500 watts but was on in good shape? I think we noticed on the early KOMs that Bauman was slapping the shit out of Formula every single time. So we hadn't seen like a sprint between Bauman and Molema yet, because I don't think Molema went for those KOM points, if I recall correctly. But uh, this means that he's definitely faster than Formula and has a proper kick. And is definitely the sprinting option of the squad. I think them in their mind would probably think, okay, Dumoulin's in that breakaway. He's of that stature. He's probably going to want to at least try something. And they probably gave them that, gave him that le- a bit of the leash to try something. But I think deep inside, I think that entire team knew that Bauman was the biggest chance of them winning this stage personally. But I did feel like they made it harder for Bauman than was necessary. Am I, am I wrong in that? I agree. Like Dumo was kind of pacing, and I don't know it. Definitely, they had the upper hand with Bowman being the punchy guy. But before we get into the finale of this stage, mention our supporting sponsor, GCN Plus, who have live rights of the Giro d'Italia worldwide, excluding New Zealand. Catch up on any of the stages when it suits you with full stage replays and on-demand highlights, all available on any screen so you can watch anytime, anywhere. All LRCP listeners from the US, UK, Australia, Canada, and Germany can get 25% off an annual GCN Plus subscription by heading to gcn.eu slash LRCP, which is in the description down below. But then we've got this like Potenza Centro short climb, and Balka Molima has to, he's not trusting himself against uh, Dumoulin Dumoulin's been pacing he's given up on the stage Bowman's come back and then Mollema Formolo countering they all I think Mollema ca- attacks a second time drops Dumoulin over that climb but Bowman's the one he wants to get rid of and he's like coming into his own closing every attack down easily snapping onto the wheel and they get into this like descent run into town Dumo comes back. He was like riding on erg mode, Benji. Literally, like it was like he, <laughs> how he used to climb when he was GC guy, just like TT. The whole actor, he's like, I'm on 400 watts erg mode, and he just does a lead out for for Bowman. They get to the final climb. Molman makes a big, big mistake. He takes the wheel of Formolo, not Bowman, on the final climb. Do I think it would have made a difference? No, Bowman way quicker absolutely destroys the other two in the sprint after a lead out from former Giro d'Italia GC winner Tom Dumoulin. They both cross the lines, arms aloft, screaming, Simon Willen! Um, if you go and listen to the tape, you can hear Dumoulin saying Simon Willen as they cross the line. Uh, and so that's... <laughs> with They've had a shit week, Benji. Like, everyone's been like, what, what's wrong with Yumbo? Nothing better than a stage win to pick up the morale. 
Yes, certainly. It's what we uh, kind of imagined them doing after their losses on the Etna because Foz lost time there. They had Ormon lost lose time there. They had Dumoulin lose quite a bit of time there. So it was expected that they try something in breakaways. Bauman was the one that said, I think, I read somewhere this morning, I don't know on what newspaper or if it was just on Twitter from like the Yambo Visma press thing, that he was going to try to win from a breakaway. So he kind of phoned it in and he said, yeah, I'm going to try this shit. And he does well do it. And it's also, he was super strong at the end of the stage to the point where it doesn't matter how many attacks that Moleman and Formula rolled to him in the last 20 kilometers, he could respond to every single one of them. And I genuinely don't think there was anything Molema and Formula could have done in the last 10 kilometers to get rid of Bauman and to make sure the stage is their way. They had to do it earlier. They failed to do so. They were gone from him on the climb earlier on, but couldn't keep that going. And that's how the race was decided. Yeah, they didn't work together when they dropped him. They were maybe scared of Dumoulin. That's why if they if Dumoulin wasn't there on the longer climb, it might have been the death knell for Bowman. But I said we'd come back to it. Now, I, I hyped up the stage yesterday. I even went on Twitter. I was like, Ineos, Bahrain, Raid. Listen, sometimes people don't have good legs. Like Carapaz might have been like, ah, not feeling it. Try the attack. Shut it down, boys. Maybe they're just like, no, like this, this stage is not designed well for a raid or everyone's too fresh after the practical rest day yesterday. That's fine. I get it. Shut it down. Passive. But then they started pacing for the last hour and 20 minutes. They took three minutes out of the break really quickly with Swift first. No, with Puccio then Swift, and then they're pacing the Potenza climb, and they're like, they're dropping some riders. They're not dropping any of the serious guys. And they did this on Etna too. This was worse in my book. What is the rationale for what they're doing, Benji? Because all they're doing, like, are they just trying to, re- they're like, okay, let's just keep the GC gaps where it is, and we're planning something for Blockhouse. I think they didn't necessarily want to make a race. They wanted to try something passive, but I agree that it's a bit too much to be really passive because, I don't know, are they scared Loki of Tom Dumoulin still? Because that's like the one thing I could think of that would make them chase that attack still, but it makes no sense to me. This break can have eight minutes and I wouldn't care about Tom Dumoulin having a minute on me in GC at the end of today's stage. And yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, you can... You can pace to keep your rider at the front in descents and stuff like that, but they were quite literally dropping the time of the breakaway from five minutes to two minutes and a half, basically. And that's, I think, not necessary. And yeah, I agree. I don't really know the reasoning or if there was a reasoning behind that. Perhaps the guy that was pacing just felt, didn't really feel, feel his legs and felt like, okay, I'm not doing that much tempo. But I don't know. It's, it's a bit too much, I think. Did you see Castro today? Castro Viejo? Where is he? See, because that was what's curious. He never should be dropping here. And I don't know if he's left the race. He's not in the first 100 riders. Uh, so that's just something to bear in mind. He's their best all round, probably domestique. Perhaps bike change? Yeah, maybe he had a. But no, but I, I didn't see him because they went, they went uh, Puccio, Swift, Sivakov, and then they didn't use Tullet. They're kind of protecting him a little bit uh, for maybe going into pink tomorrow or something. I don't know. But yeah, if you're going to be passive, save energy, save energy. Just slow pace with Puccio. Don't like, and maybe bike exchange will send a guy, shut it down. Didn't really make much sense to me, but maybe people will correct me in the comments. But otherwise, it didn't live up to the billing of what it could have been, but I think that was a very entertaining start, and I really enjoyed the break, Benji, mainly because unlike the tour last year, Molimer's Tour de France stage win being an example, we had a fight, a proper scrap for like yeah. 50Ks in the break from quality riders. I agree that the fight for the breakaway is always fun to see. It's not very easy to get into breakaways. I was speaking with a few riders that were wanting to go in the breakaway to do and fail to do so they were so set on trying to do so and it's it's just not easy to do and you have to one be lucky that your attack is the one that goes because 
you don't know if the peloton is going to react. You don't know which person in the peloton is going to try and jump. For example, we saw Juan P. Lopez, well, Kemna, first of all, try and go in the breakaway at a certain point. Juan P. Lopez directly on the wheel, and that attack went for a bit. But again, other people tried going, and other people tried going, and they were caught. And you got to be a bit lucky with which attack goes. And I love seeing that. I will say, though, that from the moment that the breakaway was formed until the last 10 kilometers, I almost fell asleep. But hey, that's on me. <laughs> I liked the battle. I knew Molimo. He was like Hollywood acting. He'd go to the back. He'd tell Dumoulin, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then attack them the next second with his hangdog expression. Um, yeah, <laughs> I thought it was great, a, a great battle in the break. So Molimo's not done yet. He still needs that Giro stage win, and he'll be going for one shortly. Kamina Benji's the one who kind of missed out on a second one. He was hope you mentioned he was hoping to nab some seconds from Juan Pe Lopez. It didn't really, didn't really happen for him. Yeah, and- but what's the idea behind it? Because like he's like getting closer gradually in GC, but wouldn't it be easier to get into the breakaway if he loses like a minute? Well, exactly. He's deliberately because normally he would. And he target today, but he's kept himself close on GC because he thought he could steal pink for tomorrow from Lopez. That's the decision he made, I think, and it didn't pay off. And Bora aren't going to pace for him. They got Kelderman, Hindley, ah, Bookman attacked early. Like they're going for proper GC, so that's it's hard to make a difference on your own. And, and uh, Juan Pe, aka El Patron, was unstoppable anyway. Tomorrow's stage shouldn't be any GC action. It's a circuit around Napoli, uh, which these often have sometimes good racing. It's a stage I would have thought Bertiol would win from a break, but he's not here, unfortunately. 154Ks up and down, uh, like 2Ks, 6.5%. For, uh, 3.3Ks, 4.5%. Up these punchy little climbs. Binium looked all right today but then it was just too much early i think it's between him and vdp in court tomorrow i i don't know whether they go break or their teams just control it because you don't want to let a big break go um and it's hard to control on a circuit what would you do if you were caught benji break or just stay in the group and tell your team to control i think court is the hardest one to predict really i think court is the one you'd say try and go in the breakaway because I'd argue that his team is not necessarily the strongest, neither for controlling, by the way. And then we look at Anton Marche and Alpesin and their teams that I could see control this stage more. But I think this hilly parkour is not going to be easy to control. The hills that are in it are, uh, yeah, simple. Like, they're, they're not easy to control. And they are the entire stage true for the last 75% of the stage. So I... Um, I think they're going to try and control it from the peloton because I think if you put Girma in the breakaway and Vanderpool, you might be ending up with a situation like to the front stage seven last year where Van Aert and Mathieu Vanderpool in the breakaway, they can't control every attack in the group and therefore someone else ends up winning. Does that make sense? Definitely, because they're that much faster. I think Ben Tullet wins this stage or comes top three. He lost, he's on 11 minutes. He's very, very good in circuit races, I think. In, Chained. Nah, he's not. The Ineos are trying to get in the break today. I, I think Ineos are not so chainy anymore, particularly particularly not in the Giro. Um, but as Settimani Copy Bartoli, he won a stage. It was harder than this in San Marino, and I think he came third on an easier circuit stage behind Hater, but it was uphill finish. So he's got to go early. If he goes to a flat finish with MVP Binium Court, it's uh, curtains, but just look out for Tullet tomorrow in the break. Your rider maybe people aren't as familiar with. In terms of GC, I don't expect much. Still Lopez with the 40-second lead on Kamna, and yeah, he should wear that uh, after tomorrow through to Blockhouse. So yeah, who have you got for tomorrow, Benji? I think like back in the day, back in January or something, I mentioned Colby for stage eight and stage 10. So he's going to win one of the two. I um, just got a feeling that it's not going to be stage eight, but it's rather going to be stage 10. I think Binyam Girma wins the stage. It's the perfect one for him. Uh, I'm going to go, I mean, I would have said Ewan. Like (laughs) he's not bad on these circuits, on these shorter climbs. And it's not like world's hard, like one and a half case. It is kind of hard. Yeah, I think it's it's tough. If he gets to the finish, then... Alperson and Intermarche have got something very, very wrong. 
Gaviria's been climbing okay, but yet yeah, I really can't go past uh, Binium or MVDP. I'm going for Mathieu van der Poel. Cool. You're allowed to do so. I don't know which one will be favorite in the betting markets. I'm sure it'll be the wrong way around. Other news was Merku's out. He left with a fever after last night. That is very, very bad news for Cavendish, who has the a melding of the A and B train. He's got Ballerini, he's got he had Merku, but second man's no good. Bert van Leeberker, I don't know if he's someone's nephew or something, but second man, that ain't him. And Cav's been trying to make it work. He won the first sprint from 300 to 75, way too early, and then too early the other day. Merku's doing his best, but this is not good for him. What The question is now, Benji, what do Lotto do? Ooh. To Mars wheel, right? Yeah, I guess they should put... Yeah, they should put Ewan on the Mars wheel now. And we also got to keep in mind that this is not only an influence on the sprint train of Cavendish, I think he's going to have a hard time finishing Blockhouse in time limit. He's got roughly an hour to finish behind the winner that day. He was on 36 minutes with the help of uh, of Merck when so forth on the Etna stage, which is a, an easier stage in my eyes, like a lot easier. And ah, it's going to be a close one. I um, I think he might just make it. And if that happens, then we've got him for stage 11, 12, and 13, which I think are three relatively sprinty opportunities if my mind serves me right. Yeah, there are. There's some decent sprints at the start of the second week. I really hope he, Ewan, and Co. Damar make it. Otherwise, Binium, when MVP leaves, is going to be cleaning up. Uh, he'll be uncontested for that stage 18. The only other dark horse I'd mention for tomorrow is uh, Filippo Fiorelli on Bardiani. They have been extremely quiet this race because, according to their management, they're actually trying to do well in stages, not just go for exposure. And he came third in a stage last year. Fiorelli's quite talented, quite fast. If he gets in a break and helps in Intermarche stuff it, then he's got a decent chance. At least he should think so. But I hope you enjoyed this recap. Thanks, as always, to our show partners, Swift, for their support of LRCP. If you want to watch tomorrow's stage or indeed any stages of the Jira, make sure you check out our supporting sponsor, GCN+. Plus. But that's all from me and Benji today, and we'll see you with the end of the circuit recap tomorrow. Ciao.